Hey. So welcome back to the last day of the uh, conference. So just an announcement. In the break, there will be a group picture. So you are invited. And uh, OK, so let's start the last talk of uh, uh, Jochen Hill. Thank you. OK, yeah, welcome. And thanks for coming to the last day. So um, so my, my final two. I, my final lecture has two two messages I want to convey. Um, and the first one is for those who don't like perverse sheaves yet, uh, that these are actually nice and useful objects and not something to be scared about. And the second uh, message links it up to the original originally planned topic of the of the, the summer school two years ago, that there is one one set of symmetries of the Hitchin vibration that we haven't seen yet that's actually useful and that's hacker operators. So that's the two things. So there are more symmetries to the Hitchin vibration and purpose sheaves are nice. And let's start with this one for the so I have to I last time I ended with the decomposition theorem. And so let me say a few more words on, on perverse sheets. Just to try to give you a feeling on how these are, are used uh, in studying Hitchens vibration and to see why these are helpful to tell you a bit more on why some of these vibrations are nicer than others. Okay, so let's let's start with a reminder on this decomposition theorem. So I had, I was in the setup that I had a smooth uh, scheme and I had a, a projective morphism. And say, for, to make my life a bit easier, I just want to, this, to think of this as a flat morphism. So actually, say, actually dimensional is what Mirko likes. So this this really doesn't matter, but it makes my life with the indices much easier. Um, and then I told you something that this decomposition theorem tells me that if I take the push forward, so if you, if I take the fiberwise cohomology of the um, the fiberwise cohomology, this gives me this kind of complex. And then if this morphism is not smooth this doesn't really need to split in, into a direct sum of its cohomology groups but it essentially it splits into the sum of its perverse cohomology sheaves so so uh, i had this so relative dimension d so so the fibers will have cohomology in degree from 0 to 2d and that's what this will actually do so you take the I have perverse cohomology. So now I have to. There's some funny shifts, and I want to talk about this. So A is also equidimensional. Um, and now I have to shift back. So usually you would take the, if I take the I's cohomology sheaf, I have to shift it back to minus I to get. So, the cohomology sheaf is then the sheaf supported in degree zero. So this minus i shift just says, please shift it back to cohomology degree i. And then there's this funny shift that I just have to do for normalization purposes. So this was this decomposition theorem. And so, and it says a little bit more. It says that this, the individual terms are also semi-simple. So direct sum, these are semi-simple. So I have to tell you a little bit what these are. So um, what are perceives? so, And where do these shifts come from? So the idea is, is um, so maybe if I maybe maybe let's let's try try the following. Suppose
is smooth. That doesn't, that's not uh, pr proper. I mean, so what, where does this this uh, perverse sheaves come from? The, it comes from from intersection cohomology, and so intersection cohomology was a cohomology theory that was supposed to take um, take care of the failure of Poincaré duality for singular spaces. So try to find try to write down a different chain complex for a singular space such that the cohomology satisfies Poincaré duality, and this kind of was um, successful, and then. In a, in a singular cohomology like way. And then the linear said you, you should write, try to write this as a sheaf property. And then the magic happened, kind of. Well, more magic happened. Um, so, so they, the Gorski, McPherson, and Delinier, they, they found a, a sheaf theoretic way of doing this. So, suppose, so the, the aim is, so, you, to explain these shifts, try to find So you take the derived category of your sheaves, so constructible sheaves, say, and try to find uh, sub objects such that the cohomology of this complex, if it is in perverse, he has a chance to satisfy Poincaré duality. So what are the first objects that come to mind? So the examples. Well, if your A is smooth and proper, of course, you might want to put the, well, maybe I should put it actually here. You might just take the constant sheaf because the cohomology of A satisfies Poincaré duality. Well, you know another sheaf. Uh, if you just take the skyscraper sheaf, at a point, well, then it's cohomology. It's just cohomology in degree zero, and it satisfies Poincaré duality. No problem. Uh -huh. So there's lots of things in between. So suppose you have a clo smooth closed sub variety. Call this inclusion iota. Then if you take the, the, she the constant sheaf supported on Z, well, it's cohomology, it's the cohomology of these, and it will satisfy Poincaré duality, right? So these are the nice objects you want to look at. But now if you think one more second about this, this is actually very bad because this satisfies Poincaré duality for cohomology between zero and twice the dimension of A. So it's symmetric around degree A, the dimension of A. This is some cohomology is symmetric around the degree of dimension of Z, and this is symmetric around zero. So, um, so they all satisfy Poincaré duality, but with respect to different dualities. So, if you think of cohomology, doing giving cohomology just goes to graded vector spaces. Well, the dual will put grading n in degree minus n. So, what you are doing wrong here is. <laughs> that you should make everybody symmetric around zero. So let's just shift this by dimension of A, this by dimension of Z, and this we leave as it is. So now if we take these sheaves, they have cohomology symmetric around zero. So it goes from minus dimension of Z to plus dimension of Z, right? And so these are the building blocks that I would like to have. And the magic is that this works. So there exists an abelian category inside that contains these things. And that if you're yeah, in this situation, even has the derived category giving you back this thing. So it's a, that's sort of the sheaf of nice, nice 
complexes that actually do satisfy a version of Poincaré duality. So what's the official definition? Is probably the following. So K in DB of A is perverse. If now you look at this, these conditions, so you want that the dimension of the support of the uh, of some cohomology sheaf of K is less or equal to to I, and so now I have to put minus I here in order to make this uh, match with these examples. Right, so full support I'm allowed to have in cohomological degree minus D and support at points I'm allowed to have in degree zero. Right, so that, because this is what I need if I want to have the cohomology to be concrete dual. Now this definition is not a good definition because well, it does not satisfy this duality plus the same condition or the dual. That I don't write for the value dual complex. So that's this category, which is a bit, yeah. Okay, so these are the building blocks somehow. And so what a, the, the nice thing is that the simple objects have a concrete description, which is very similar to this one. You do the following you take. So this is a closed sub variety and this is the open inclusion of the of the smooth part and then you start out with a local system and then the building blocks are well maybe I call should call this j the building blocks are what's called the middle extension of this local system. And then you just, uh, so now I have to do the same thing that I do all the time. So I have to put it in the right cohomological degree and there I just leave it. So they are obtained. So this is the middle extension. of LZ and it's characterized by satisfying I mean it's there is a functor that's well that's possible to define but usually hard to compute that uh, that creates out of this a new perverse sheave so it should satisfy this condition but it doesn't it shouldn't contain any any um, any other um, perverse ingredients that are supported on on um, on the closure. So what you that so it's characterized by being perverse on the one side and satisfying the strict inequality for all higher cohomology sheaves for both k and the dual, saying so less or equal to i for all. Uh, I that are not uh, uh, dimension of Z. Same for the dual. That yeah. So I'm sorry. It's simple object. So if I start out with some simple, yes, right. Uh, Yes, yes, you're right. Um, no, but it's right what I wrote, actually. It's open off smooth part. So, no, no, but you're, you're, it's good that you point it, point it out. Um, so how should I write it? Subset smooth. Yeah, so it's, I, I wrote something wrong, but I, I, I kind of try to write. So what I'm, of course, I mean, if I'm, if I'm on a smooth variety, I should be able to, to throw out some devices and take a local system that has monodromy around the devices. 
that is uh, something that I should be allowed to have. Right, <laughs> thank you. More things that I did wrong. So that's the, so my, my main obstruction for first trying to read perverse sheaves was that this inequalities with minus signs inside them are kind of hard for me to read, but that's the way I can remember it. Good. Um, okay, so that's, that's what this means. So now may, maybe let's, let's, I told you th these are usually, I said these are usually not so easy to compute what they actually are. Although, yeah. Um, I wanted to make one, one remark. This Poincaré dwell, so in this, in this, aha, so I forgot to state this here. This, this decomposition theorem is uh, sum of simple uh, perverse sheaves. And there's the additional information that these HIP, they satisfy uh, hard left sheds and Poincaré duality. Because that's what these were made for, to make the fibers to satisfy. So, so what I mean by this is that if I take an ample class, it gives me a cup product on this complex by shifting by degree two. And so I really mean that on these cohomology sheaves, I get a hard left shed thing. And the zero thing is dual to the thing that I get in degree 2D. And the, the important remark is that hard left shed and Poincaré duality constrain the, sh the possibilities of which summons, what type of summons, can occur in the day in, in this in the in this in this decomposition. And let, let me let me try to explain this. So every so if I take a perverse sheaf, so if K is perverse on A, then I know it has cohomology sheaves. Well, this, this tells me that it has cohomology sheaves in degree minus dim A to zero, right? So that's how we made it. The support condition says nobody is allowed to have supports bigger than zero. Um, so now if I unravel these shifts, then this, let me, let me picture these. So I have H0, H1, and so on. And I end with end with H two D perverse cohomology sheaves. So okay, where does this start? So I know that these perverse complexes, I, I can't remember the shifts, but they have length dimension of A. So I know that RF lower star, this will start in the cohomological degree of the sheaves of um, in which the in, in which there are the sheaves complexes have cohomology sheaves. So it's it go it starts with zero and it can have length n, so it ends with dimension of A. So this one got shifted one more up. So this will start in A and go to dim A plus one. And then we go up and up and up, and we end with something that has cohomology in degree 2D to 2D plus A, dim A. Right? So that's where the cohomology sheaves can occur. But now we have a second look on what you actually have, because after all, we took the direct higher direct image under some proper morphism that has fibers of dimension D. So the this complex only has cohomology sheaves up to dimension 2D. 
So in this top part, it will actually end here because there's no cohomology sheaves here. Right, so this will actually be an honest sheaf. Um, and so there will be the only support that this can appear, can come from is the full thing A. Aha, uh -huh. but now you also, this is, pro so, but now I can apply either hard left sheds or prong grade duality to tell me, well, this, guy, this sheaf complex is isomorphic to the complex down here. So in degree zero, this will, the cohomology sheaves will also end here. And so I actually know what this is. This is just a constant sheaf. It's just R, R zero lower star of Q because that's the only thing that can appear here. And they can run the same trick in the next part. So here, this will end at two and so on. Just before cross the next one here, will start at 2D minus one, 2D, and then it has to stop. Good. So that's the typical method on constraining what kind of complexes can actually occur. But this was part one of the lecture. Questions so far? Yes? Yes? Yeah, so, so by dual condition, I mean, the, I, I have to apply Verdi duality to this complex. So if it was, a, I mean, I'm a smooth, um, on a smooth variety. So what's the, I take home into the, the, the dualizing sheaf on a smooth variety would be the constant sheaf, forgetting some, some Hodge twists. And then uh, it comes with a shift of twice the dimension. So if I take the, the constant sheaf on my variety, put it in dimension uh, minus dim A. I dualize, I get, I get up to dimension two, uh, the dimension of A, but then this value duality shift shifts back by twice A to down again. In some sense, yes. On the other hand, you can just apply everything you do. Uh, if you if you know these how these dualizing things are constructed, you can. I mean, this is all local conditions. So locally, you can just embed your variety into a smooth variety, say an affine space, and then um, everything works out fine. So you can just write down the same conditions on any variety, not necessarily smooth. The only problem th that you have is that if I actually want to compute the Verdi dual. I might prefer to work on a smooth variety, but um, yes. So this is just, yeah, yes. So, so, so first I think of embedding this thing into a smooth variety and think what complexes would I take there. And then I just go to my uh, Things six functor formalism and uh, work out that actually it would be okay to not embed. More questions? So, um, yes, so now let me remember what was the next thing I wanted to do. Yes, right. So now I want to go back to my Hitchin vibration. So it's why some versions of Hitchin's 
vibration are more pleasant than others. And this is, I mean, in, in one of these two proofs of the P equals W conjecture, this doesn't actually appear in officially, but um, sort of behind the scenes it does. So this goes under the name support theorems. So in ghost supports even. Um, so what, aha, okay, so I forgot to say, so the supports of these, of uh, a perverse sheave are just the um, generic points of these um, Zs that occur in this decomposition. So the simple objects I told you, they are obtained from middle extension from local systems on smooth sub varieties. <laughs> Uh, closed, um, yeah, smooth, locally closed sub varieties, and their generic points as give you where these things are supported. And uh, the setup for us was, was the following: so we had this moduli space of Higgs bundles, and maybe we decorated this with some. Um, the set over the Hitchin base. And on this, we had an action of the relative Picard group of the, well, of the Picard group of the um, relative spectral curve was acting there. Um, now, what does this Picard group look like? for any A, this Picard group, pick zero of C of A, has a natural decomposition. Namely, you can, can map this to the Picard group of the normalization of the reduced curve. So you can just pull back, right? You can pass to the underlying reduced curve, take the normalization. This is a smooth projective curve. So you might know that this is an abelian variety. So it's a complex torus. And the kernel of this it's what I would call PCA affine. The kernel happens to be an affine group scheme. an affine group. So the example that you could keep in mind was your nodal curve, which, um, which gave you a, a GM in your Picard. And so if you think of taking a smooth curve of higher genus, um, gluing, identifying two points, so then what's a, what's a line bundle on here? It's a li line bundle on the normalization together with an identification isomorphism of these two things. So that's why you will find an extension of the Picard of the normalization and the GM that gives it a gluing thing. If your singularities are worse or your curve is non-reduced, you will also find copies of GA in here. It's just some abelian group scheme that can be what it is. Now, um, so this is, uh, in particular, this is projective. Now, <laughs> suppose, aha, uh -huh, so one thing that I didn't tell you about this action is something that you can easily, it's not hard to check. Um, the stabilizers of uh, of the Picard action of big C A zero on Higgs are actually affine. So it's uh, th this is not so. This is not too 
too hard to say say so if you're if you we would be in this situation it's kind of um, um you see that that if you if you have a sheaf here you can pull it back to your normalization and on the normalization tensoring with a line bundle on pick is a is a free operation and so that's why these um this bit of the thing cannot have stabilizers and if you think long enough you can upgrade this argument to an honest proof even not assuming reducedness or anything but this the stabilizers are affine uh -huh. So this projective part of the Picard actually acts freely on this thing. And then there is this, suppose we knew that the cohomology of this, so let's call this PA proj, and this I call P P A affine so what is this actually this P A proj well it's the cohomology of an abelian variety so it's just the exterior algebra of the h1 of the normalized curve um let's say x really on the cohomology of the fibers. So I, I haven't even told you how it could act, but suppose we knew something like this. I will tell, tell you maybe one step. Then, then this would constrain The supports further right so our the only trick that we used was well if i see some 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 um, some sheaf occur some cohomology sheaf occurring here um and I happen to have some operator that lies, allows me to shift it a little bit up, then on the top bit, I know that it can't go beyond 2D. So it will constrain what can happen below here. And this is Ngo's observation is to, to dream that this, this actually happens. And so Ngo proved this theorem. Uh, so it's the following. So if the dimension so if the co-dimension of the space of all A in A such that the dimension of PA affine uh, is bigger or equal to the dimension of PA affine, then all supports appearing you take the co-dimension of the set of all points a in your base where the so you take all points in your base ah so this bigger equal to D, bigger equal to D. I think usually it's called delta. Because this thing is, is the delta invariant of the curve and it's, it measures how the cohomology of the curve differs from the cohomology of its normalization, which by deformation theory tells you that it's this dimension. Then all support <laughs> appearing in RH lower star Q are detected by R to D Q. 
by the top sheaf. Um, yes, I think that that has to do for 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 today. Um, it's a bit of a vague statement, but it's what I wanted to say. And there's um. And Lomon, they used this to actually compute what this is. They said that this implies that for, for the moduli space of Higgs bundles, if you allow some poles, it is an effective divisor. Yes. Yes. So if you if you have some support appearing here, then you can use this shifting by this exterior algebra to actually put it up somewhere where the high where the support bit will be on the highest cohomology sheaf. So you can only have supports if this thing it fails to be locally free so if you so you can just look at the dimensions of the fibers of this this top, i mean this top cohomology sheaf just says how many connected how many irreducible components does my fiber have so this gives you a stratification on the base and so it's only where this number jumps that you can possibly have a new support So it's the twice the dimension of the map H, I said. So twice the dimension of the fibers. Two dim E H, yes. Sorry for this more readable. Yeah, so that's a good question. I try to avoid. So okay, maybe I um can I first finish this sentence and then ask? <laughs> I try to answer this question because otherwise I will have to, to um, semi-stable over the Hitchin base that I would also decorate with a maybe I should put a D. Well, maybe I put write I A of omega D. Um, so it's now no longer the direct sum of H zero of the omega tensors of omega, but H zero of the. Uh, and we are in the co-prime situation. The, RH, the only support. Is. Is equal to the direct sum. Of the middle extensions of the. I exterior power. Where J is the inclusion a smooth where this is the part where the spectral curves are smooth so where a smooth set of all a such that c a smooth uh, and now i have to shift Well, so the cohomology of the the cohomology of the, the uh, Jacobian is just the exterior power of the first cohomology of the curve, and so over the open subset of where this the fibers are just my Jacobian, I know per I know well perfectly well I know rather well what the cohomology of the fibers is, and so 
I can, this gives me a local system on the base and I can apply this magical functor middle extension to give me a complex. And they proved that in this case, the cohomology of the vibration is actually completely determined by knowing what this vibration does on the smooth curves, which is a miracle and hopefully convinces you that some versions of the Hitchin vibrations are more pleasant than others. Namely those where all the cohomology is somehow determined what will happens for the smooth family of curves. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's, uh, and so if you try to do this for the original Hitchin vibration, sorry, I was trying not to say Hitchin vibration because he at some point the remarked that it's kind of unkind to make the name to an adjective. But so, okay, so it's, uh, 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 this was just a joke from his side. But try to take it seriously. Hitchin's vibration is um, that there sort of this inequality just holds, but so wherever the number of components of the Jacobian connected components of the uh, Jacobian changes, you may or may not have additional supports. And um, on a good part of this uh, vibration, we actually know that actually they do have new new supports when you have, are in the scope prime situation. And Mirko now knows that maybe that was just due to the fact that this co prime situation wasn't so natural to start with. Okay, so now to your question. So you had the question, why, are, why should this act at all? And um, I don't think I have, have really something uh, useful to say about this, but the, the, the way this argument, I re try to remember this argument is similar to the way that Jordi was talking about for the cohomology of toric varieties. Namely, you try to divide out by the action of the Picar. And then if you divide out by just the projective space, you get this kind of a nice, nice quotient and you know something about its cohomology. And then you just have to know something about cohomology of vibrations that are torsors under Picard. And these tend to split into things that are governed by these exterior powers. And the only problem is that on the nose, this doesn't quite make sense because this projective part of the Jacobian doesn't really fit. And so you have to struggle to make this work. But on the level of cohomology, it does. And that's where he uses that in general, to formulate its, his general theorem, he uses, uses that you have a polarization on this, that this is a polarized family. But that's all I can say. I mean, the, the idea is to take these quotients and to reduce yourself to the quotient of a free action of, a, of an abelian variety on a, on a variety. And then you see that this. Yes. 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 Well, but I mean, in some sense, in, in some sense, you could ask, what does it mean to improve? Because you can't be better than to be the middle extension of the smooth part. Yes, but this, I mean, this, I think it's... <laughs> I mean, you could think that this complexity improves if you make it bigger, but on the other hand, you have higher co-dimension possible to control when you make it bigger. So you actually don't want to make it too big, I think. And it's not so, I mean, somehow you might think that, okay, the smooth part, the complement, I mean, the first bit of the complement I might understand because I might understand what, what the first bits of singularities are that appear. And then you can compute the monodromy of your local system around this and maybe be able to control. But this is the thing that always happens with this middle extension. So the first few steps are not are something you can control, but at some point in higher code dimension, it becomes very difficult to say what the functor actually does. So it's, I don't, I mean, 
if somebody had a good idea on how to actually compute this, this would be wonderful, but I, I don't. Good. Um, so maybe maybe I should remark that Morlik and Shen and Shen found a very nice. Uh, in a in a previous paper, a uh, uh, beautiful argument, geometric reason relating, uh, allowing to um, well. Compute um, the I H lower star Q for the Higgs for omega from the part from the version for omega of, D, of P. And P is a point, fixed point in C. So I, I have 15 minutes, so I, I will not go into, into how this, I will try to prevent myself to, to say anything about how this goes, but there is a way to do this, which is beautiful and uh, in the end reduces to a group theoretic computation. So the upshot from this is just that once we, if we allow ourselves in thinking of the cohomology of coming from generated by tautological classes, then actually there is there is a way to transfer the P equals W conjecture to a statement where you can go to this other vibration, to the more pleasant vibration. Good. Okay, so now the last bit of the talk. And this last bit is just a little bit of an outlook that um, I wanted to, to say, so the last bit will be called hacker operators. Well, I will not be terribly precise, but there's, there's one more symmetry on these modulized basis of Higgs bundles that that we haven't talked about so far, and that is uh, interesting and is very prominent and uh, would would have been very prominent in the original theme of the conference on on Langlands correspondence. So what 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 uh, what are these? So for vector bundles and curves. This is a similar construction than the hacker operators that you might have seen for, for elliptic or moduli of elliptic curves. So how does this go? So you fixed your, take a moduli space of vector bundles, use a vector bundle of rank N and degree B minus one. So this is usually called ban ND and take a, curve and we take a second call B minus one. So this is just all vector bundles where the degree of E is D and the rank is N. And then there's something that's called the Hecke correspondence that parameterizes you take a point in your curve and you take a modification of your vector bundle 
So here, these are the E primes, uh, such that the quote, I mean, because they differ such that the quotient is E P divided by E prime P, this is um, L P. Uh, so this is just the residue field at P, so skyscraper sheaf. supported at P. And there's this kind of correspondence and it looks a bit strange at first sight, but this is actually something that you might, might recognize. So, well, so why, why do I, so this, this, this space has two forgetful maps. One is to you remember P and E prime and the other one is just you just remember E. So this is called Hecke one and D maybe. You can describe this in a different way. Um, if I would like to, I would like to think about the fibers of this morphism and the fiber of this morphism are just projective spaces. I mean, in order to get this, sec this short exact sequence, I either have to remember E and E prime or just I just remember E and the quotient that I got at the fiber at P. So this is the same as taking a point, a vector bundle E, and V n minus one in E P a subspace of dimension n minus one. So it's a projective in and point in the projective space of this, or or it's dual depending on your normalization or one-dimensional quotient, if you prefer. So the fibers of these morphisms are actually flag varieties. They're very nice. And because you have such a correspondence, the, you can, can get an action on the cohomology, taking classes here, pulling them up there, and pushing them down. Um, well, and I hope this reminds you of what you do for elliptic curves, where you also take these operators by, by modding out by a subgroup of order P, which is kind of similar. One, and this one corresponds to that. I just have this dimension one. I just take a modification of length one. And these are an additional symmetry on, on bun. And there's a version for these for Higgs bundles. You can do the same for Higgs bundles. For Higgs bundles. You can also look at this thing. You take your point uh, E that comes with your X morphism omega one. And now if you want to modify your bundle, the thing that you have to make sure is if you take the fiber at P stable under phi at P then this still has this morphism. Right, you have these two forgetful morphisms and you would get an action of these correspondences on the cohomology of this thing. So there's a problem. Um, respondents does not preserve 
stability condition or bundles. And that's actually something that you could take as an exercise that um, iterating these operators, you can get from every bundle to every other bundle. I mean, you may, so for, a, if you think of this, just this, cor this kind of correspondence, just for line bundles, then what does this do? It doesn't do much. It just takes your line bundle and takes it to the line bundle tensor to divisor. But well, if I can contain there with any divisor, I can get from every every bundle to every other bundle. It will cover the whole of Picard in in some higher degree. And so the same thing, same argument essentially works for every vector bundle. And so you will be this this messes up things. And there's a but. It's a but for Higgs bundles. The, it, this, this Higgs morphism isn't really changed by modifying. So the characteristic polynomial doesn't change. Characteristic polynomial doesn't change. Or saying, so the, I mean, I could write, I've written this as a modification of bundles on my curve. But if I would consider this as a rank one sheaf on my spectral curve, the same operation would just modify this rank one sheaf at one of the points lying above P. And so, but, uh, and for irreducible spectral curves, so for integral spectral curves, There is no stability needed. So over the over the part where my spectral curve is smooth, for example, these operators make perfect sense. There's no problem with stability. And in some sense, this this is uh, what these two arguments that I that appeared in both of these papers. There's a version of this thing appearing. And maybe to end in the last four minutes. So to give you one one. So in this this first proof of Maulik and Shen, they do something very wonderful. And I want at least to this this doesn't this appears in a variant. I hope that I'm not making a mistake and I should take this larger, but I think one is okay. So I take the six bundle space. So this was this dull bow space, but where I have to allow poles at one divisor. So I told you that there's a way to go from the problem for the original vibration to this nicer vibration. Okay, there's always, I mean, as you as you may see in this, thing, choosing an n minus one dimensional subspace for a group theorist, um, this is uh, taking the parabolic subgroup of GLN that has a GLN minus one and a one block, which is a nice thing because its quotient is projective space. But from a group theoretic perspective, um, the nicest parabolic subgroups are Borel subgroups. They have the mo most symmetry. So they say, maybe we should look at these. So we take a point E, take a Higgs field. And we take a flag, a full flag. Stable. 
under phi. So what this means is that, well, here you can just evaluate at, at your point P. And if you think about where you go, something like this. Maybe you should write it like this. So if I just try to remember the, the Higgs field only at the fiber at P, it's an endomorphism of E, which is this Lie algebra thing. And then for deck people, I have to take the, I mean, choosing a basis, I would get an element in the Lie algebra and then maybe I shouldn't choose a basis. And what this, this thing above is, is, I mean, this is actually a fiber product where you say, well, okay, here you chose your, near your endomorphism on your vector bundle and here you have to choose a flag that's stable under it so this is what's called the field filter omega g on n where g tilde is the space of pairs of a matrix and and The flag variety, this is the flag variety, such that this operator respects the flag. So how do you say this such that G in G inverse AG is in the upper triangular matrices. And that's a famous resolution the Springer resolution. This is nice because here you can map back to the flag variety, and this is actually a B bundle. And so from this, you get that here there's an action of Sn on the cohomology. So it's kind of funny. So there's an Sn action on the. So if my if my my endomorphism is semi-simple, if it has n distinct eigenvalues then the only possible flags I can choose are ordering of the eigenvalues. So generically there's an SN action and for perverse sheaf reasons, this implies that you get an SN action in the cohomology and can compute the cohomology downstairs from the cohomology upstairs by just taking invariance. But what does this help? I have to stop. So what did we do? So, so the, the basic, object that gave us cohomology classes was the universal bundle on the space. Now, if I pull this back here, this universal bundle gets a full flag of subbundles. So here, if I take this pi upper star of E, it has the quite marvelous, has a full flag of sub bundles, right? Because here at every point of the P, you chose a flag. And so here we were interested in the churn classes of the universal bundle. So if we want to prove something upstairs, we just have to cope with the churn classes of these line bundles, which might be easier because it's just first churn classes. We also put ourselves in a situation where the situ where everything was determined by on the smooth fibers. So we just have to say what these churn classes do on the cohomology of the smooth fibers of a Picard. And there Jibay Yun computed that they actually are zero. And this gives the perverse thing that they need. So this is, this allows to control perversity of cup products. C1 of these VI divided by VI minus one. And that's the magic of this argument. And the second article that I haven't quite understood, I mean, uses the, the full algebra of Hecker operators to get a finer statement than this. Okay, thanks. That's all I wanted to say.
Thank you. So are there questions? Yes, um, I was wondering if there is a way to phrase these uh, hacker correspondences for Hex bundles in terms of coherences on surface like this. Uh, yes. So what you, I mean, what, what, what this whole thing just does is you take your, your bundle and change it by a length one sheaf. So if I want to consider my hex bundle as a sheaf on the surface, I have to pick a point in the support of my sheaf. And there again, I can take a one dimensional quotient of the fiber, take the kernel, I get a new torsion free sheaf on my surface and that's the hex operator. Again, on surfaces, again, if I take a complete surface and I have no other control, it's not at all clear that this will preserve stability. Thank you. Hmm? Yes. So for surfaces, you can write down the same thing. You put the surface here, sheaves on a surface, sheaves on a surface where the second churn class draw, uh, increased by one. And here you take two sheaves with an inclusion such that the co-colonel has rank one on the on the support point that you fixed. Of this picture, no, this I don't know. Sort of, it it kind of appears in 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 the article as passing to parabolic bundles, where you can control a bit better. And I don't see, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering in, also in this last part, so uh, you're working with uh, semi-stability, uh, so you're taking semi-stable X bundles downstairs. Uh, so then upstairs where you have this parabolic structure, is there a particular choice of parabolic weights also that you need yes. to choose to get semi-stable ones? Yes. So you, you have to, you ha I mean, in order to get this morphism, you have to choose your weight so small that the semi-stability is completely determined by the semi-stability of the underlying vector bundle. In the co-prime situation, this is possible if you do your weights very, very small. And also maybe a second thing, because uh, you mentioned that uh, like with pure analogy with, uh, with this Grotendieck Springer resolution, you can compute the cohomology downstairs yes. in terms of upstairs. Yes. Uh, what is the action on the fibers here that allows you to do it? So you look at this yeah. Cartesian diagram and you say that um, um, because this is Cartesian and this is actually a smooth morphism, um, you can, this map was a semi-small map that was the whole thing, then this is semi-small. So again, there's just the action that you get on the smooth part. Um, well, it extends to the... Yeah. Hmm? Uh, sorry, small. It, it's small because I, yes. yes. Sorry, I, thank you. <laughs> Just have a left field question, yes. last comment. So in the um, Agreski McPherson paper on um, equivariant cohomology, yes, they have this sweep action where they say that if I have a torus acting on a space and I take a homology class, I can, like, let's say S1 acts, I can take my homology class and kind of sweep it around by my S1. Then they explain that you get an action of the exterior algebra. Um, and I've kind of always thought that perhaps, you know, if you suitably dualize this, then that's the then go action. Yeah, I haven't checked that. It sounds very plausible because the, the thing he does is also thinking about the quotient by the Picard action. And so it, it feels like you, you should be able to compare this. But I haven't, I haven't really thought about this. But it, it feels, yes. And they kind of show that that sweep action is like, equivalent so there's a causal duality between that sweep action and equivariant cohomology so yeah this yeah so this sounds very much as if this 
I mean, right, if you have this, this is, yes. Again, this is comparing it with equivariant cohomology very much looks like what Go does by taking this, comparing in the quotient. So it should be a way to relate them by, by I can I cannot on top of my. <laughs> Other uh, questions? Uh, I was wondering uh, if I can like also transport this kind of Hecke correspondence to the uh, Betty site. So, uh, like, what would be the analog of Hecke one B or? Whatever? Great question. Great, great question and. It would <laughs> and maybe I should even know the answer, but I don't know, but I, I, it's a great question. Hmm? There, so the, the question was, um, can you make sense of this diagram on the Betty side? And it's a it's a wonderful question that I'm aware of and that I don't can, cannot answer. Okay. Thanks. Which is equivalent to saying that I cannot answer it today. I mean, so yeah, so there, there is, uh, uh, yes. So yeah, there, there is, yes. It's a good point. So, yeah, so unfortunately, I cannot answer this question today, but there are places in the literature where you could stare at and try to understand what it means. And maybe Jordi can explain to you in the coffee break to do the thing that we did yesterday in the for dinner, just naming a random person. <laughs> yes. No, but it's, it, it's it, yes, I appreciate the question and I wish I would say something about it more sensibly. Are there uh, comments, questions? Okay, I think we can thank uh, uh, Einlot for the great uh, talks. We restart with the last lecture of uh, Jordi Williams. Thank you. So as promised, is that working? Yeah. So today is the uh, Dolce. And um, this theory was introduced by um, Peter Brennan and Juni Ha. And Juni's Fields Medal citation mentions Lorentzian polynomials and particular, and in particular the proof of the following conjecture, which I will now state, uh, I, I just wanted to say two things. The first thing is that today will be rather more impressionistic than previous lectures, uh, essentially due to time constraints. So I will speak, I'll do more verbal, I'll do more hand waving, uh, and just try to give you an idea of what I think is a very beautiful theory. And the second thing is that the talks of Juni and Peta on this subject are fantastic. Uh, and so if you're actually interested in this, there's you know, watch a few more talks, um, particularly, so Juni's ICM talk is one of the best talks I've ever seen. It's just absolutely remarkable. Uh, there's a very nice talk of Juni in the, um, the Zoom algebraic geometry seminar, where he takes a slightly different point of view. And there's a very nice talk of uh, Peter Brendan in the matrix uh, that's an Australian seminar where there's a recording available. Uh, Peter gave a very nice talk and also has a slightly different take on the subject. And so that's very nice to see. Okay, so essentially like if this is recorded and you're watching it, you are making a mistake. 
watch the other recordings that are available to you. Uh, strong Mason conjecture. So we start off with V1 up to Vn inside V of vector space. And we can do another one of these counts that we've been doing. So fk is the number of subsets of v1 up to vn of size k. And we want these subsets to be linearly independent. Okay, so this belongs very much to the world of kind of these combinatorial counts. Uh, and I mean, it's a very fun thing just to do a few examples. So let's do an example. So if we take the Fano plane, so we take uh, the set of non zero vectors in F two cubed, we get the following famous configuration called the Fano plane. So this is, because I'm over F2, vectors, non-zero vectors are the same thing as points in, so this is the same thing as points in P2 over F2. And here they all are. So there's seven of them. And if I do these counts, so there's seven points. No two points are equal. So there's seven choose two. Uh, two element independent subsets. And uh, and if we look at F3, so what we kind of expect is seven choose three, but there's one, two, three, four, five, so one, two, three, four, five, six lines. So it's seven lines. Oh yeah, for, it's very important. This, this is also a line. Seven choose three minus seven, which should be equal to 28. So, so we get these numbers, 7, 21, 28. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, so what, what does strong Mason conjecture say? From 72, it says that these numbers are what's called ultra log concave. So this means that F K minus one divided by N choose K minus one, F K plus one, N K plus one is less than or equal to F K over n k all squared okay and this is what's called ultra log concave okay so concave means that yep as you as you go up the intermediate version the intermediate version is bigger than or equal to the average of the two, the average on either side. Log concave means if you take logs, that's true. So the sum is replaced by a product. And now, the, and there's very, there's a lot of sequences in combinatorics that are expected to be concave, log concave, or slightly stronger than log concave. And then you start getting all these different, um, different versions. And this is kind of the strongest version ultra log concave. And where do you kind of expect this? Um, another way to think about this conjecture, you know, I'm absolutely not an expert on this conjecture, but this is just what I've ma managed to ascertain kind of, is that 
let's just imagine that we just take, for example, a basis. Okay, so fk would just be n choose k, and so then we get the inequality: one is less than or equal to one, which is of course correct. Uh, and what what it's kind of saying is that we that's the general behavior that we expect, but we only expect deviation from that behavior in one one direction. Okay. And this is proved. This is uh, proved. Um, in 2018 by um, Peter Brandon and Juni Hu, Juni Ha in their paper on uh, Lorentzian polynomials. But I just want to mention that it's also proved at the same time by uh, four people uh, whose background appears to be more in computer science, Anari, Liu, Ores, Garan and Vincent. It's one of these remarkable situations. So if you look at these two papers, um, the actual attack on the conjecture appears very similar in both cases. And it's kind of remarkable that this proof of a major conjecture in combinatorics uh, occurred basically to two, two different groups of people at the same time. The okay, proof appears quite similar. So. I want to uh, explain Lorentzian polynomials with the goal of um, explaining a proof of this, uh, which I, I consider to be kind of one of these proofs from the book. If you introduce Lorentzian polynomials, you can prove this in a couple of lines, which is pretty remarkable. You know, modulo a theorem about Lorentzian polynomials that I hope to explain. But before we get to that, I want to give the, so this looks at the, this stage, the way this is as though this is rather far away from um, Hodge theory. And I just want to explain what I understand is a major motivation for Juni, which is uh, basically the question of kind of volume polynomials of projective algebraic varieties. So this is where I want to be sketchy in order to not take too much time, one of the places. But let's just imagine that we're in this setting that, we're, that we've often explored in this course. So where we have smooth projective algebraic variety, where it's kind of of Hodge tape type. So it's odd cohomology vanishes and everything's generated by algebraic cycles. So only PP type occurs. We've got H2, H4. and H6, let's say. So let's say it's a three-dimensional variety. Now, if we have, so I, this is in some sense kind of my motivation. Well, you know, like this is how I kind of tell the story to myself and we'll see if you find it convincing. So whenever I have an ample class, I can consider multiplication by this class and it satisfies hard left shits and the Hodge Riemann relations. Okay. And what's really interesting to kind of think about, at least for me, is that as you vary your ample class, the, um, the primitive components move around and somehow they move around in a way. So there's the, all these forms everywhere and they move around in a way that's compatible with um, like the Hodge Riemann relations and all this kind of stuff. Huh? And so already in the case of one ample class, you've got a rather remarkable structure going on here. Just before I go on, I just want to um, state the following dream, which I've never gotten to gotten to work in any situation, but if somebody could get it to work, I would be so delighted, which is, so I had some questions yesterday about the statement. So there's a statement that hard left shits is the same thing as this being the E in an SL2 representation. And this is a really lovely, simple exercise. Okay. So this satisfies hard left shits, if and only if um, there's an F 
such that you get the SL2 relations. Yeah? And then the primitive, primitive components are the lowest weight spaces and these kind of things. Now, if you read Griffiths Harris, the proof of the hard left shed's theorem is the following. They have a metric on their Kähler manifold. They have Hodge star and they, they have the operation of multiplication by my Kähler class. And they conjugate this with the Hodge star. So if you imagine what happens when you conjugate by H star, so your original H star, your original left jets operator goes up. So what you do is you go conjugate by, um, so yeah, you start up here, con go down with Hodge star, do your left, left jets operator, and then go back with Hodge, Hodge star. And so you get an operator of degree minus two going down. Yeah. And then there's this crazy argument of churn where you compute the commutator of E and F and you get exactly the SL2 relations. And then they say, by the representation theory, there's a little page on the representation theory of SL2. And they say, by the representation theory of SL2, we're done. Okay. It's just such a crazily elegant proof of hard left jets, in my opinion. Yeah. And then we have all these like very complicated situations where we can establish hard left jets by much more complicated means. But a dream is to find some situation in the world that is not Kähler manifolds, where you can write down F and check the commutation relations and get hard left jets for, out of the representation theory of SL2. Okay? I've tried to do this in several situations and always failed. Okay? But I think it's a very tempting thing to try to do. Okay, so end of rave, back to motivation. We have an ample class. Now, something that you may not have realized, I was, I was a little bit shocked when I realized this, is that I can take different ample classes here. I think that this was first observed by Katani Kaplan. I'm not 100% not sure. Okay. So that's um, amazing, I think. So I can just take any sequence of ample classes and still I get... the this thing is part of an SL2. Okay. Now, uh, and also if you want to prove that you can take many, um, think about the key idea from yesterday and you'll be able to prove it very easily. Okay. So it's not a difficult thing to prove, but I think it's a kind of interesting observation. Okay, so we can just take a whole sequence of different ample classes. And also it's very common in kind of my world that we don't have a canonical ample class. And so I kind of want to use them all at once. And we don't really have a good way of using them all at once, okay. in my opinion. So there's this very interesting work of um, Luen Galunz called the Neron Severi Lie algebra of a projective algebraic variety. And what Luen Galunz do is they say, okay, take one ample class, complete it to an SL2. So you have an F. And then look at the Lie algebra generated by all of these E's and F's for all ample classes. And then what they show is that this generates a very, very large Lie algebra in certain cases. And basically the larger this Lie algebra is, the simpler the, Ho the Hodge theory of your variety is. Yeah? And so this is one way of, um, of using all these ample classes. So yeah, so motivation one is we should consider all of these at once. Motivation two, is that often in combinatorics, you get some statement by going to the boundary of the ample cone. Okay. So this is all fine. If so, remember, we, I want, we, you should have this, um, this picture in mind where this is the Neff, Neff cone. And inside is ample. Okay. And there's many statements um, for example, but the statements that I've been discussing um, in the first lecture and also in the, um, in the toric varieties, where you can rephrase as statements about some um, Neff class on the boundary actually satisfying hard left jets, even though there's kind of no reason why it should. So if you think in algebraic geometry language, what we're saying is that there's some map, which is not an... Um, which is not an embedding, which is, for example, semi-small, which happens to be semi-small for no apparent reason. Okay. So we should, we should consider everything at once, 
and we should consider what goes what what goes what happens when we go to the boundary and so this leads to the following question which is so suppose i have omega 1 omega n nef classes okay classes of numerically effective line bundles then what can we say about so and we have x of dimension d what can we say about the integral over x1 omega 1 xn omega n to the d okay so this is a polynomial in xi with positive coefficients. So that's the question. And the answer is, well, one answer, which seems to be rather convincing given the kind of scope of the applications is this polynomial is Lorentzian. Exactly. Yeah. So typically, I mean, in the in the situations that I've encountered, you, you'll have you know a nice kind of polyhedral cone, and then the omega i will be the rays generating this cone, and they're very very far from satisfying hard left sets of individually. But if I take a, a non-negative combination of them all, then I get a hard left sets class. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes, but I think it doesn't need to be. So I think the statement that it's Lorentzian is true. Yes, it's def definitely. So I'm, I'm not assuming that, um, that, um, a generic comment, a generic positive combination of these is ample, but in many examples it will be. Exactly, yeah. No, so left left means that it. it so left means you're actually determining a semi-small map. Yeah, so you, you'll if you imagine your cone, I don't know, my imagination is you have this cone and then certain um, boundary components will correspond to left ones and certain will not. And I'm definitely not assuming that they do. Yeah, and some of these problems in combinatorics are like the following boundary component is a left class. And it's very difficult to see that it should be true. Okay, so I need to detect, I need to tell you what Lorentzian polynomials are, but before that, I think I just want to do a brief interlude on m convexity. M convexity. So I'll be brief here. So, um, for, to ease things later on, I want to say a level set. in Rn is a set of lambda i in Rn such that the sum of the lambda i is fixed. Okay, so this is an affine, a level set is an affine space. We don't have a zero, but it's a torsor under the set where this is zero. So it's a, an affine space. It's a vector space where we don't know where zero is. And then we have a permutahedron, a generalized permutahedron. is a polytope 
in a level set of Rn, all of whose edges are parallel to the vectors in the type A root, root system, EI minus EJ. Okay. So I'll give you an example of what, uh, here's a picture of So in a level set for n equals three, if I take one of these level sets and I look at these vectors inside it, I get like E1 minus E2, E2 minus E3, E1 minus E3. So these are my allowed directions in my polytope. And a permutahedron, generalized permutahedron, is a polytope where I'm only allowed those um, edge directions. So it's a polytope with constrained edge directions. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure if you've ever done this, but it's kind of an amusing thing to think about taking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten as a vector inside R10, and then look at the polytope generated by um, all of the permutations of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I get this beautiful polytope, and all of its edges will will belong to this set. And this is a permuta. This is a genuine permutahedron, and generalized permutahedron to generalized permutahedra are things that look a bit like that thing. Uh, and then an m m convex set. J, so this is inside Z n begin that are equal to zero, is a um are the so it's n convex hat is the set of integral points of an integral generalized permutahedron. And integral means the vertices are integers. So this is an example of an So this would be what an m-convex set looks like. So this would be my set J. <clears throat> so these polytopes are, are special. Um, and I, I don't understand this at all, but apparently this, um, this notion of M convexity is a very useful notion in um, the theory of discrete op optimization. And just before we leave M convexity, I want to give you two examples. So if you consider, so remember our V1, Vn from before in Mason's conjecture. So if we consider the set of vectors of the form I in I, EI, where uh, I inside is independent. This should be an M convex set.
And similarly, EI over um, I in T, where T in some graph is a spanning tree, uh, not a spanning tree, a, a tree is also M, M convex. And uh, a matroid is an M convex set of level one. So this means all, um, so this is, ah, uh, no, is this right? No, that's wrong. Is an M convex set consisting of um, zero one vectors. So I don't know, there's, there's, there's a certain number of mathematicians in the world that really like matroids. And I've always found it like really, really difficult to grapple with matroids. So matroids, for example, are when it when it's a very it's a combinatorial notion of independence. So for example, whenever you have vectors in a space, vector fixed vectors in a vector space, you have a corresponding matroid. And there's about 20 different mat definitions of matroids and they're all all equivalent. Um, but somehow this um, this kind of way of thinking about matroids I find the most illuminating for me, which is that there's some kind of very um, so it's a distillation of basically some notion of convexity. So somehow I can imagine permutahedra or I can, I can um, pretend that I can imagine them. They seem to make some sense, you know, some kind of polytopes or something. And when I distill that and force all my vectors to have zero one coordinates, I get this notion of matroid. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's equivalent to it's a beautiful exercise to see that this is equivalent to your favorite definition of matroid. Okay. Or maybe you don't have a favorite definition, which is my case, and then I like this definition. Okay, so now we can get to what Lorentzian polynomials are. No, I mean the so it's you know, matroid is something of the form zero, one, one, zero. All of the vertices are of this form. So, HND should be polynomials. The genius polynomials of degree D in N variables. So with R coefficients inside this, we consider. So firstly, I want to set up what we would kind of consider the like inside the Neff cone version of this. Okay. So this is. Um, L two zero. So this is so these should be degree two polynomials. So this is quadratic forms. Of signature minus one one. So minus plus plus. Sorry, the other way around. Very important plus minus minus. Okay, so that's why that's where Lorentzian comes from. So we're working in Lorentzian signature, and then um, strictly. So here I have this notion of strictly Lorentzian polynomials. N D is those f such that 
if I take the i th i derivative, this is in l zero d minus one open for all i. So what we're doing is we're putting conditions on our polynomials of degree two, and then above that we're making some inductive definition. So we want all of the derivatives to lie, all of the derivatives to be Lorentzian. So what that means is that, so this is easy to, easy to work out. I take a polynomial of degree 20, and then I just take every possible way of generating a degree two polynomial out of that via derivatives. And I require that all of these are of this signature. So this is called strictly Lorentzian. In n variables, yeah? Ah, sorry. And this is called strictly Lorentzian. Okay. So that's easy to work out. Now, the problem, which I haven't really thought about, but Juni claims is difficult, is so, and then we define uh, L D N to be the closure of L N D zero. And this is Lorentz in polynomials. Sorry? Ah, uh, sorry. I mean, I should have said with positive. Here, I should say with positive coefficients. Does that answer your question? So, what, what's your question again? Yeah. So this sits inside. This is a subset. Yeah, exactly. So I, I see this inside H D N and I take the closure in the classical sense. So things inside here are limits of um, Lorentzian polynomial, strictly Lorentzian polynomials. Okay. Now the claim, which I think is rather interesting, and as I say, I haven't really thought about, is that it's a priori rather difficult to decide whether a polynomial is in here. So Juni gives this example of x1 cubed plus x2 cubed. Okay. The claim is that this is not Lorentzian. And, but the issue is that if you take any of the, of the derivatives of this thing, it is a limit. And so somehow this is far away from being Lorentzian, but it's rather difficult to tell. Okay. Does anybody have a sense of where this signature comes from? Maybe that's a, a good question. Sorry? Perhaps. But yeah, this is a course on Hodge theory, yeah? So if we take a surface, then the Hodge index theorem tells us that the signature on H2 is Lorentzian. Yep. This is our ample class, and this is the what happens on the complement. So this is in the in the bottom right of the board, but it's very important. This is Lorentzian polynomials. So uh, the canonical example, so I just want to give um, some remarks. Probably the nicest simple example other than the example, well, it is secretly the, the example before coming from the NEF classes, 
but the kind of canonical example of a Lorentzian polynomial. is I take a few different polytopes or, or more generally convex bodies. And I consider the poly polynomial, which is the volume. So this is called the mixed volume. Or so the components of this are called the mixed volume, but of x1, p1 plus x2 p2 plus x3, p3. So this is Lorentzian. Okay, and this is the Minkowski sum of these polytopes. Maybe it's interesting, uh, to whom is it, is it clear that this example is the same as the polynomial that I wrote down before coming from the NEF classes. Okay, yeah. So I had to think a bit for why this was the same thing. Uh, and the other, uh, so this is entirely made up by me. And this is just some attempt to imagine, try to imagine what's going on. So in R3, imagine that I take the positive orthant. So, so here's the positive orthant. And then imagine that I take a slice like this. So what I think is going on, so if you think about what this kind of exactly one positive eigenvalue means, so if we think as is the case in geometry that this positive eigen, eigen line will lie kind of into the positive orthant here, what, what, what this is saying is that once we kind of slice across that positive ray, then everything's going down. So it's like we have this, our positive eigenvalue, And then as we move to the boundary, it kind of tails off in a convex way. It's, so it's the, the function as we move off to the boundary is tailing down. And this is, the, this is happening for all its derivatives. Okay. So it's very much, so um, w when, you, when you listen to Juni and Peta talking and you read their paper, they're always talking about convexity. Like this is some kind of, discrete, like you'll see a theorem in a second where, where their, their kind of motto is it's linking discrete and continuous convexity. And my issue is Lorentzian signature doesn't look particularly convex to me. You know? But I think that once you look kind of orthogonal to that positive eigenvector, you do get very strong convexity. Yeah. Okay, so this is the link to convexity. And their theorem is, um, is that f in h in d is Lorentzian. If and only if, two things happen. Firstly, the support of f is M convex. Okay. 
So this is saying, so this function we just write write out all its poly we we write it out as a polynomial, and we look what are the supports of the non-zero terms of this polynomial. This should form an m convex set, and b. So the same condition as before. And now this is a very checkable condition. So for example, when you do that X cubed plus Y cubed example from before, you know, its support is not M convex. So it's not Lorentzian. So you can decide immediately. So it's very checkable. Did I want to write? L instead of yes <laughs> thank you definitely okay and uh, just as an exercise this is very fun and I did it at 5 a.m this morning so if we take a polynomial in two variables, a i, x to the i, y to the n minus i is Lorentzian. If and only if a i, the sequence a i is ultra log concave. Okay, so you can see already there's a, there appears to be a connection to these kind of questions in combinatorics about ultra log concavity. And what are we doing here when, like, let's think back to our algebraic geometry world. What, how are we forming this sequence? We're taking two NEF classes on something, and we're taking all possible ways of like doing, you know, like, so our dimension is D, we're, we're, Cupping this with itself i times, cupping the other one with itself n minus i times, and producing a number out of that. And so the claim is that sequences that we get in that way are always ultra log concave. And this is interesting because it, it, you're seeing another application of kind of Hodge theory and combinatorics. Like a lot of these applications are saying we can produce a vector space. And there's some count related to that vector space that gives us the answer to a combinatorial problem. Here we're seeing something different. We're seeing um, quantities of importance in combinatorics coming out of intersections occurring in the in the variety. So there's this work of Adi Prazito, Juni, and Katz, where they established some very fundamental conjectures in matroid, matroid theory exactly by realizing these numbers AI as certain intersections in a kind of Hodge theory like ring. Okay, so now I just want to uh, finish with the, the argument for Mason's conjecture. So using, using this theorem, Mason's conjecture follows very easily. So I hope you can see also what I was saying before, which is that there's this kind of remarkable link. So on the left-hand side, we have a statement that's very much in the world of continuous convexity. And we're saying on the right-hand side, we've just got a condition about, um, condition about um, M convexity, so discrete convexity plus something inductive. So there's some kind of discrete uh, continuous going on. I realized I didn't say, it's very important that L N two is forms with at most 
So I didn't define the base, base of the induction forms with at most one positive eigenvalue. So that should be considered as part of that theorem up there. I mean, that's very easy, but. So now I'll just um, do the proof of Mason's conjecture and then finish. So we consider We consider the following innocent looking thing. So it's the sum over I. So remember we have our vectors V1 up to Vn and we have subsets of one up to N independent. So in V of dimension D. So independent means the corresponding list of vectors is independent. And what we want to do is basically take a product over I and I of Xi. But this is not homogeneous, so we homogenize it by adding a power of D minus I. And by this exercise, so yeah, that's the state. So the first statement is that F is uh, Lorentzian. Lame. Now, how do we check this? The support is the support given by a matroid-like thing from before. So the support is M-convex. Okay, essentially by the matroid example that I gave before. Okay. It's immediately checkable. You can just stare at it. If you've got the right parts of your brain switched on, it's immediately obvious. Uh, support is M-convex. Now comes like something just absolutely beautiful, I think. If we take the i derivative, so this is our, let's write f of m, meaning this is the f associated to this particular configuration of vectors. Then di of f, another little thought exercise. This is just f of m, where we quotient out the i vector. Okay. So quotient out v mod v vi, we get a new configuration in that vector space. The derivative is that guy. So by induction, we can assume this is Lorentzian. So this is for all i bigger than zero. This is Lorentzian by induction. And then the only thing that we need to check, so we need to check that d zero. So whenever we have a, whenever we take a di, we're done by induction. So the only issue is when we take d zero to the um, d minus i um, minus two of f, we need to check that this is Lorentzian. And this is an easy exercise. Okay, we, we take the derivative of this a whole number of times, and then we're given by an explicit, we're given an explicit degree two polynomial that encodes kind of very simple aspects of this configuration. So, and we just have to check that something has the right signature. Easy exercise. Okay. So this is Lorentzian. And now if we specialize FM, this is exactly one of those situations before where I said that going to the boundary, yep. Oh, just because I'm, thank you. That was a Friday mistake. Uh, so now we do, we see this phenomenon that going to the boundary does something interesting in combinatorics. So we take X zero 
T, T, T. What's this? This is exactly, here we're just counting our independent set according to its size. So this is X zero. So this is our FK X zero to the N minus K T to the K. And specializations like this of Lorentzian polynomials are Lorentzian. So this is Lorentzian. And now we're done by star, by that exercise. Okay. It's pretty amazing, I think. Like this, this is really a conjecture that has been attacked by many different people in combinatorics from many different points of view. Um, so I'll finish with two remarks. The first one is that even when the V1 up to Vn are, let's say, in R to the D, there's no algebraic geometry proof known. For most of these statements, if you kind of specialize them enough, there's some variety and there's some Hodge theory. This is a statement where there is no such specialization known. And um, the second thing is that this is what I was saying before. So we get um, quantities. In combinatorics by the integral of this form. And as far as I know, it's an open question. Um, I haven't followed it recently, but as of about a year ago or something, it was an open question if you can produce a Lorentzian polynomial that's not the volume polynomial of some projective variety. And I'll just repeat my comment from before. If you want to know more about this, watch the amazing lectures that are online. Okay, so thank you. Questions? Going back to this Hodge theory setting, uh, how do you show that those polynomials are Lorentzian? Can you do that directly, or do you go through some Hodge theory? How do you show which, which polynomials are Lorentzian? Uh, the the when you say linear combinations of left classes. Ah, yeah. So, if I take an Amble class, uh, yeah, doesn't it? Isn't it just that I take I take an Amble class, and then I deform all of my guys by epsilon times my ample. And then this is Lorentzian on the, this is strictly Lorentzian. And so now setting epsilon to zero realizes my class as the limit of strictly Lorentzian things. Okay, so this is when your NEF classes generate the NEF cone? Or... No, if I just, I choose a, another ample class. Doesn't matter, doesn't have to belong to my. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, in the beginning when you were uh, defining ultra log concave, so you mentioned that there are these different notions of concavity, and that this was sort of the strongest one. How do you see that there that it is the strongest one? Like, is that precise in some way, or that's a good question? I think that's beyond my background in this in this subject. Um, I just know, like the the ordinary log concavity statement was was a rigid was um was proved in several cases and then there was an epsilon added and then this was called strong log concavity and then this is called ultra long co log concavity in some some papers so yeah I, I don't know to what extent 
fun can kind of make that really formal. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? No? Okay. Then I think we can thank uh, Jordi Williamson for uh, the great lectures. Thank you.